Scholastic Audio presents Geronimo Stilton, The Temple of the Ruby of Fire, by Geronimo Stilton, read by Bill Lobley. A Mysterious Yellow Envelope Early one morning, I got up and ate breakfast. Another day, another cheese Danish, I said to myself. Then I ran to the subway. I didn't want to be late for work. Oops, I almost forgot to introduce myself. My name is Stilton, Geronimo Stilton. I run the most popular newspaper on Mouse Island. It's called the Rodents Gazette. Now wait, let's see, where was I? Oh yes, I was on my way to the office. When I got there, I found a mysterious yellow envelope on my desk. It was addressed to me. I recognized the handwriting. It belonged to Professor Paws von Volt. The professor was a famous scientist. We became friends during one of my many adventures. I slit open the envelope. My paws were trembling with excitement. Any message from the professor is always thrilling, but... It wasn't a message that thrilled me this time. It was four plane tickets to Club Mouse in Crocodilia. Do you know where Crocodilia is? It is on the Amazon River in Brazil. The tickets were made out to me, my nephew Benjamin, my sister Thea, and my cousin Trap. I wondered why the professor needed our help in the Amazon. It was all very mysterious. I called my sister. She is the special correspondent for the Rodin's Gazette. Hold on to your whiskers. I have incredible news, I announced. Professor Von Volt has sent us tickets to join him on the Amazon. My sister squeaked so loud my ears rang. Holy cheese! What a you mouse scoop for the rodents gazette she cried you get the gear i'll tell the others we'll meet at the airport in 15 minutes one thing you should know about my sister she loves to give orders my ears are not stuffed with cheese i ran right away to rats authority the best store in town for sporting goods. I picked up some stuff for our trip to the tropics. Then I rushed to the airport. My little nephew Benjamin gave me a mouse-sized hug. Uncle Geronimo, I'm so glad I'm going with you, he squeaked. I smiled. Oh, how I love that nephew of mine. Just then, my sister started yelling at me. Did you get everything, Jerry Berry? Well, well, she demanded. When I didn't answer right away, she pinched my tail. Are your ears stuffed with cheese, Geronimoid? She added. Did I mention my sister can be a pain in my fur? Thea popped open my suitcase. Then she began digging through it. I had packed four pairs of waterproof knee-high boots, four pairs of comfy camouflage pants, four hats with mosquito netting, a first aid kit, and more. Looks like you have everything, Thea said approvingly. But right then, a voice chimed in. Everything? Are you kidding? It scoffed. If it weren't for me, you would have forgotten the most important thing. Food! I turned around, but I knew already who was squeaking. It was my cousin, Trap. That mouse could eat a 500-pound rodent under the table. Yes, eating was not just a hobby for Trap. It was his life. Now, he waved a piece of Swiss cheese under my snout. Go ahead, try it, Cousin Kins, he ordered. But before I could open my mouth, he swallowed it in one gulp. I was furious. Ha ha ha! You always fall for it, Germeister, Trap guffawed. 
Then he showed me a little silver knife he wore around his neck. I just finished a cheese tasting course, he explained. I always wear this little knife around my neck. You never know when something yummy may pass your way. Suddenly, a big, beefy rodent in a muscled T-shirt walked by. He was munching on a cheddar sandwich. Trap took one look at that sandwich and whipped out his knife. Before I could stop him, he'd sliced off a piece of it. Muscle Mouse turned around. He was infuriated, and he was glaring right at me. Hey, yo, what do you think you're doing? He shrieked. I tried to explain, but he wouldn't listen. If I catch you, I will tie your tail into knots, he shouted, chasing after me. I hid in the restroom. Cheese niblets, this trip was getting off to a terrible start. If I catch you, I will rearrange your fur. Five hours later, the plane was ready to take off. I was still hiding in the restroom. What else could I do? I didn't want to get mashed to a pulp by old Muscle Mouse. I could hear him squeaking outside the door. If I catch that rotten mouse, I'll twist off his tail. I'll rearrange his fur, he growled. My teeth were chattering so fast, they could have won a tap dancing contest. I waited until the last possible moment to leave the restroom. Last call for flight 285, departing for Crocodilia. Last call, a voice announced. This was it. I had to make a break for it. Quiet as a mouse, I slipped out of the restroom. Then I raced for the plane. Paws pounded after me. Come back here, you no good cheese nibbler! I heard Muscle Mouse screech. With one last gasp, I jumped on board. A few minutes later, we took off. The trip was very long. After all, the Amazon River is not on Mouse Island. It is far, far away in South America. That's a whole other continent. Big time fun. Finally, we arrived. A tall, lanky mouse with red shorts, curly fur, and a purple ponytail greeted us. Welcome to Club Mouse, he yelled. Are you ready for some big time fun? We've got big time volleyball. We've got big time water polo. You name it, we've got it. Big time. He was jumping up and down like an aerobics instructor. I rolled my eyes. Oh, how I hate these types of resorts. I'm not into organized activities. I just like to do my own thing. I couldn't wait for the professor to show up. Then I noticed Ponytail Mouse was staring at me. You need to turn that pout inside out, Stilton. Big time, he said. Before I could stop him, he began tickling the bottom of my paws. I rolled on the ground in a fit of <laughs> giggles. <laughs> Can you guess why? <laughs> I am very ticklish. <laughs> Excellent. Now you've got it, Stilton, Ponytail Mouse shrieked. Then he waved his tail in the air. Theme song, he called out. Five sweaty mice appeared out of nowhere. They began to dance and sing. Here at the club, we're into big time fun. We like to swim and dance and sing. We like to do most anything. So join on in now, don't be shy. Give snorkeling a big time try. Yes, at Club Mouse, we never frown. And if you do, we'll track you down. When the song ended, Ponytail Mouse clapped his paws. Hello, rodents and gentle mice, he yelled. I am the head of this club. My name is Rowdy Rat Big Time. I'd like to remind you that our hee-hee-ha-ha lessons start at six o'clock. Hee-hee-ha-ha lessons? What were they? Probably some ridiculous club mouse ritual. I shook my head. 
Did I tell you I hate organized activities? I glanced at my watch. It was exactly six o'clock on the snout. Just then, Rowdy Rat grabbed me by the tail. Slimy Swiss balls. He was dragging me up to a big stage. I turned pale. I hate dancing. I hate singing. But most of all, I hate making a fool of myself. Let me go, please, I squeaked. But Rowdy Rat didn't listen. He forced me to dance. The crowd roared with laughter. Then Rowdy Rat tickled the bottom of my paws. I rolled around in the sand in a fit of g- giggles. Oh, why did I have to be so ticklish? <laughs> Stilton, you're gonna have big time fun, even if it kills you, Rowdy Rat insisted. I groaned, big time. Meanwhile, Rowdy Rat was busy making more announcements. I love you all, Club Mousers, he yelled to the crowd. Everyone cheered. And now it's time for our water polo tournament, he continued. Last one in the pool is a rotten rodent. The crowd made a mad dash for the water. I made a mad dash for my room. I'd had enough of this big time nonsense, enough to last a lifetime. I couldn't wait for Professor Von Volt to arrive. These are called click clicks. Ten minutes later, Benjamin skipped into my room. A huge grin spread across his face. Uncle, look, I caught a crab, he squeaked happily. He held out a disgusting orange crab that had a ferocious look. My fur stood on end. Where did you find it? I stammered. Benjamin pointed outside. Right here, on the beach. Rowdy Rat Big Time taught me how to fish for crabs, he explained. He said these are called click clicks. I don't know why, though. I started to tell him to put the crab down when tragedy struck. First, that hideous creature glared at me. Then, it jumped at me and pinched my tail with its claws. Click, click. Ow, ow, ow. I shrieked at the top of my lungs. Uncle, are you okay? Benjamin cried. I didn't want to alarm my nephew. Let me explain to you why they call it a click-click, I mumbled. Then I fainted. When in doubt, I give an injection. I came to in the infirmary. What? Where am I? The crab. Click-click. Uh, I babbled. Dr. Wacky Whiskers held up a long, pointy needle. When in doubt, I give an injection, he said. Everything gets better with an injection. My eyes nearly popped out of my fur. Quick as a flash, I jumped out of bed. I raced for the door, screaming, It's a miracle! I'm cured! Oh, when was Professor Von Volt going to get here? I found Benjamin in our room. Uncle, how do you feel? He asked. Just then, Rowdy Rat poked his snout in the door. He tried to tickle me. I bounced into the air and landed on a sea urchin. Yowie! I shrieked. Uncle, I'm so sorry. My nephew apologized. Rowdy Rat helped me find that sea urchin on the beach. I should have known. That obnoxious rodent was getting to be a big time pain in my fur. They carried me to the infirmary on a stretcher. Dr. Wacky Whiskers shook his head. You again, Stilton, he mumbled. He grasped a syringe. When in doubt... I give an injection. Everything gets better with an injection, he declared. This time, 
I didn't have the strength to run. Oh, how did I get myself into such a mess? Worse than Tutankhamun's mummy. Thea and Trap came to see me in the infirmary. This place is great! Thea squeaked. I'm enjoying myself big time! Today, I took aerobics, windsurfing, water skiing, kickboxing, and deep sea diving lessons! Trap nodded. I'm having the best time too, he agreed. I played big time soccer with Rowdy Rat. Then I stuffed myself big time at the Chuckle Cheese Hut. Sounds great, I mumbled, but I was lying. I'm not much of a sports mouse. And who knows what kind of cheap food they serve at a place called the Chuckle Cheese Hut. As soon as I felt better, I decided to go to the beach with Benjamin. I dipped my paw in the water. It was cold. Maybe I'd stick to sunbathing. Just then, a mouse came racing right for me. He was screaming something. I groaned. It was Rowdy Rat. I dove into the water to get away from him. That's when I found myself in the middle of a school of jellyfish. They stung me all over, even on the tail. Rats. Rowdy Rat pulled me out of the water. I was trying to warn you that there are big time jellyfish in there, he said. Dr. Wacky Whiskers shook his head when he saw me. Stilton, what a surprise, he smirked. He smeared a disgusting, stinky cream all over my fur. Then he wrapped me up in bandages. I was more preserved than Tutankhamun's mummy. When in doubt, I like to give an injection, the doctor told me, as if I didn't know that already. He pulled out his long needle. I was horrified. I was queasy. I was never so glad to see my cousin trap in all my life. He whisked me away in a wheelbarrow before old Wacky Whiskers could stick me again. Oh, I couldn't wait for Professor Von Volt to arrive. Would you prefer wind, stench, or mosquitoes? The next morning, Benjamin and I went to the beach. I stretched out on the sand with my book, Inspector Cheesy Cracks the Case. I love reading silly mysteries when I'm on vacation. Ah, now this was the life. The sun, the sand, the surf, the wind. Yes, the wind was so strong, it nearly ripped my whiskers off. Rats! I packed up my things. We moved to another beach. Yes, this was more like it. No wind on this beach. But what was that? awful smell. I grabbed my nose. The stench was worse than my cousin's stinky fur after a workout. It stinks. Once again, we moved to another beach. Cheese niblets. This one was infested with mosquitoes. Oh, where was the professor? This place was a nightmare. Benjamin tried to cheer me up. Uncle? Don't be upset. It's not so bad, he soothed. What do you prefer, the wind, the stench, or the mosquitoes? Before I could answer, a seagull began circling overhead. Squawk! Squawk! I shuddered. I don't trust seagulls. One time, a seagull stole my glasses right off my face. It took me ten hours to find my way back to my beach blanket. Just then, the seagull dropped something on my head. It was a piece of paper wrapped around a heavy wrench. Holy cheese, I squeaked. Benjamin read the note out loud. Dear friend, I knew I could count on you. 
I will wait for you at midnight down by the river. Make sure nobody sees you. It is very important we keep our meeting a secret. Mousy regards, Professor Paws von Volt. I breathed a <gasps> sigh of relief. Finally, the professor had arrived. Land, sea, or sky? At midnight, Thea, Trap, Benjamin, and I went to the river. How would the professor get there? By land, by sea, or by sky? You see, the professor liked to use many different types of transportation. Trucks, helicopters, submarines. They were all made in his laboratory. Every one ran on solar energy. He was always perfecting them. One day, the professor wanted to pass on his inventions to the world. A planet without any pollution was his biggest dream. I paced up and down the riverbank. Benjamin stuck to my side like glue. Tell me again, Uncle, about the time you saw the professor on Mount Everest. That must have been so cool, he squeaked. I wonder if I could be the professor's assistant while we're here. Can you ask him, Uncle? Can you? Can you? I nodded. The professor had never met Benjamin, but I knew he would love him. Who wouldn't love such a sweet, adorable mouse? Suddenly, the water began foaming with waves. A yellow submarine decorated with cheese holes broke the surface. With a loud pop, the hatch opened. A pair of mouse ears stuck out. Professor Von Volt, I called. Stilton, Geronimo Stilton, the professor answered. Welcome, my friend. The Importance of Being Stilton The professor invited us inside his submarine, the Wonderwater. He explained how the sub ran on batteries. The top part of the submarine is made up of silicon crystals, he said. When the crystals are exposed to sunlight, the batteries are instantly recharged. The professor led us into a huge living room. A Steinrat grand piano stood in the corner. I wished I could play, but I wasn't a very musical mouse. I had trouble playing the kazoo. Behind the piano was a bookcase filled with books. On the walls hung the professor's beloved collection of priceless paintings. Besides the living room, there was a kitchen, an aquarium, a greenhouse for growing fruits and vegetables, and a computer room. Holy cheese! This place has everything, I remarked. The professor patted my shoulder with his paw. Yes, everything except a good friend, he said with a grin. You are a true gentle mouse, Geronimo Stilton. I blushed, but I noticed Trap rolling his eyes. He hates it when rodents talk sappy. So, do you have anything to eat? He asked, patting his tummy. I groaned. Oh, why was I related to such an obnoxious mouse? The professor offered us a plate of cheese sandwiches. Then he told us why he had brought us to the Amazon. I am searching for an ancient Incan temple, he began. It is said to be hidden in the thick trees and plants next to the river. Inside the temple is a giant ruby. It would be an amazing archaeological find. I thought you might like to join me. We all agreed enthusiastically. Wait till they hear about this at school, Benjamin squeaked. 
I told the professor how my nephew wanted to be his assistant. Volt beamed. That would be fabulous, he cried. I really need a trusty rodent to take notes for me. Benjamin was thrilled. Thanks, professor. You won't be sorry, he exclaimed, giving me a hug. A Voyage on the Amazon River Soon we were on our way. We sailed up the Amazon River. What an unbelievable sight! The plants were lush and incredibly green. Multicolored birds sat on the branches of the trees. Crocodiles floated like killer logs in the water. Enormous hairy spiders, carnivorous ants, and poisonous snakes watched us from the shore. I shivered. I was glad I was on the sub. Don't get me wrong. I like wildlife as much as the next rodent. But this wildlife was a little too wild, if you know what I mean. I chewed my whiskers to keep from shrieking with fear. I didn't want anyone to call me a scaredy mouse. I forced myself to listen to the professor. He was giving Benjamin a history lesson. The first rodent to land in the Americas was Christopher Columbus in 1492. But he thought he had reached India. That's why he called the local people Indians. After Columbus, the conquistadors arrived from Spain. They were soldiers who conquered land in the name of the King of Spain. Next, adventurers from Portugal came. They colonized Brazil, he explained. Why is the river called the Amazon River? Benjamin asked. Perhaps some of the soldiers saw native women sailing up the river, armed with bows and arrows. These fighting women made them think of the Amazon warriors in Greek mythology, the professor suggested. Then the professor sighed deeply. He said he was worried about the Amazon forest. Long ago, the conquistadors had destroyed lots of historic artifacts. They had forced the natives to give up their traditions. Today, greedy mice continue to damage the forest. They chop down trees and pollute the water. If it doesn't stop soon, we will have an ecological disaster on our paws, the professor moaned, shaking his head sadly. Along the river, we noticed huts made out of leaves. Natives armed with bows and arrows peeked out. When they saw the professor, they smiled and ran down to the river. These are the Yanomami. Like their ancestors, they live in the forest. The forest provides them with everything they need to survive, the professor explained. They love nature and they respect it. We should all follow their example. He docked the submarine. Then he embraced their chief. You could see that they were great friends. The Yanomami We stayed with the Yanomami for a few days. We listened to stories around the fire. A Yanomami taught Benjamin how to make bracelets out of toucan feathers. Another painted designs on Thea's fur with sap from uruku berries. I can't wait to show Timmy Tidy Tail at the salon, my sister gushed. Yes, those Yanomami were fascinating rodents. I could write all about them in the Rodents Gazette. The chief explained how worried he was about the forest being cut down. I nodded. Maybe I could write about that too. I will try to help you, I promised the chief. Soon, it was time to go. We said goodbye to our new friends. Then, we sailed up the river.
a mysterious noise. Soon, we reached the beginning of the Amazon River. We were in the land of the legendary Incan Empire. The professor turned on the computer. He showed us a bird's eye view of the forest. The plants are less dense here, he said, pointing to a spot. I think that's where we should search for the Temple of the Ruby of Fire. We hid the submarine in a cove on the river. Then we trudged through the forest. We walked for hours, cutting through the vines with machetes. I was sweating. My back was aching, and I had blisters all over my paws. Rats! I couldn't wait to get back home. I would book a whole day at the Restful Rodent. Have you ever been there? It's one of the most relaxing spas in New Mouse City. Finally, we reached a tiny village. The chief greeted us warmly. Welcome, strangers. My name is Strongfur. This is my wife, Warmfur. And this is my daughter, Monkeyfur, he said. Please follow me and I will introduce you to the rest of our village. That night, we sat together around the fire. The chief and his family were warm and friendly. I could get used to this place, I decided. It would be great to escape the rat race. Maybe I could even change my name. Brainy fur might work, or maybe trusty fur. I was still thinking about a good name for myself when the chief's wife asked, What brings you all so far from home? We are looking for the Temple of the Ruby of Fire, Professor Von Volt said. Strongford jumped to his paws. He had a strange look on his face. There is no temple. There is no ruby, he said. You must give up your search. The whole village repeated his words. No, no temple, temple, no ruby, no search. We were shocked. What were the villagers hiding? Still, something told us not to argue. For once, even my obnoxious cousin kept his snout shut. That night, I was snoring happily when a mysterious noise woke me up. What was that? Thea whispered. It sounded like something buzzing. Watch out for the biters! The next morning, we asked the chief about the strange noise. Noise? What noise? He answered. Noise! What noise? noise? The natives repeated. Deep in thought, I went to the river to get washed. I bumped into the chief's daughter, Monkey Fur. Watch out for the biters. There are a lot of them in the river, she advised. I looked into the crystal blue water. I didn't see anything. I wondered what she was talking about. So I bent over to wash my face. Suddenly, Monkey Fur began jumping up and down. Biters, watch out, she squeaked. She pointed to a school of fish headed for me. They were so small and colorful. Oh, those cute little fish won't hurt you. Here, fishy fishy, I said, sticking my paw out. I grinned at Monkey Fur. She needed to get out more. Maybe I could help her overcome her fear of fish. Even a scaredy mouse like myself had overcome my fear of the dark. Well, sort of. I still slept with my cheese ball the clown nightlight on. But uh, don't tell anyone. Just then, I noticed something odd. The fish had opened their jaws. I saw two rows of teeth. Sharp teeth, rancid rat hairs. Now I knew what biters were. They were piranhas. 
I jumped out of the river in three leaps. Monkey Fur breathed a sigh of relief. My paws were shaking like furry leaves. I decided to rest under a tree. But before I could sit down, Monkey Fur began screaming again. Watch out for the caiman, she yelped. Help! I jumped up. Click! An enormous crocodile snapped his jaws at me. I headed back to the village. Wash out for the tail that stings and the vine that suffocates, Monkey Fur called. I looked all around. I saw nothing. Nothing at all. Was Monkey Fur pulling my tail? You are looking, but you are not seeing, Monkey Fur explained. She pointed to a poisonous black scorpion hidden in the leaves. Then she showed me an anaconda slithering on a branch right over my head. Cheese niblets! Monkey Fur giggled. If you want to survive in the forest, you need to use your eyes better, she advised. I nodded. You saved my life. How can I thank you? I asked. See, like in Cayman. Monkey Fur showed me a notebook. Do you know how to read? She asked. When I nodded, she looked impressed. It seemed no one in the village knew how to read or write. Can you imagine? Reading and writing are my life. Only they can do it. Monkey Fur blurted out. Then she clamped a paw over her mouth. Who are they? I asked. But she wasn't squeaking. I was dying to know what secret Monkey Fur was keeping. But I decided it wouldn't be right to pry. After all, she had just saved my life. Instead, I offered to teach her how to read and write. We sat down by the riverbank. We began with the alphabet. A, like in apple. B, like in banana, I recited. Monkey Fur giggled. I think I've got it, she said. Then she pointed to a pair of yellow eyes watching us from the river. See, like in Cayman, she said. She grabbed my paw and we raced back to the village. Yes, Monkey Fur was a fast learner, but I was the fastest runner with that croc on our tails. In the Dead of Night That night, I went to sleep with my clothes on. I put my flashlight next to my sleeping bag. I wasn't taking any chances. What if a snake slithered under the door? What if a scorpion crawled through the window? What if my cousin put itching powder in my sleeping bag? Trap loves to play pranks on me. Once, he tied a bell to my tail. When I took a step, I sounded just like a cheese ice cream truck. Rodents came running from all over town. I was sleeping soundly when I was woken up by a noise. It was the same mistake mysterious noise from the night before. I woke up Thea, Trap, Benjamin, and Professor Von Volt. Quiet as mice, we went to investigate. We discovered a horrifying scene. A team of rodents was busy cutting down trees. They put the trees on a big truck. Soon, there would be no trees left. The professor was furious. Scoundrels, he whispered, enraged. They have no respect for the forest. We decided we'd better keep quiet. I mean, these were rotten rodents, rotten to the core. One chubby mouse appeared to be the boss. The others called him Nasty Tail. His fur was slicked back on his head. He wore a huge gold medal around his neck. It said... I'm nasty, 
and proud of it. He had a thick gold watch on his wrist. A glittering diamond hung from his ear. Bones, do this! Bones, do that! He shrieked at a mouse as thin as string cheese. The mouse was wearing a black shirt decorated with skeleton heads. He had an evil expression on his snout. I shivered. Okay, boss, we're done here, he told Nasty Tail. Tomorrow night, we'll change campsites. But we'd better watch out for those natives. We don't want them getting any funny ideas. Just then, an enormous rodent with a crew cut came strutting over. His paws were as big as my Aunt Ratilda's ten-pound cheddar logs. His teeth looked like they were made out of steel. His name was Mike Mison. Don't worry, I'll handle them, he sneered, grinning at Nasty Tail. If they get out of line, I'll just squash them. He jumped up and down, punching the air. Then he punched a tree. It split in two. Part of the trunk fell on his foot. A big hairy spider crawled out of the trunk and bit his toe. Ow! The big mouse screamed. Bones giggled under his whiskers. Nasty Tail just rolled his eyes. My son, he squeaked, you may be big, but you have the brain of a bug. The strangers are right. The next morning, I talked to Strongfur. We know about the evil rodents who are destroying your forest, I said. We want to help. We must stop them before it's too late. Strongfur shook his head sadly. I'm afraid no one can help, he said with a sigh. They have threatened to burn down our homes. Suddenly, Monkeyfur jumped to her paws. The strangers are right, she cried. We must return to the house of the howling spirits, where the tombs of our ancestors are buried. Howling spirits, muttered Thea. Tombs, added Benjamin. Okay, spill the beans, said Trap. Slowly, Strongfur let us in on their secret. It seems they were the last descendants of the Incas. For years, they had been living deep in the forest, next to the house of the howling spirits. It was the same as the place we called the Temple of the Ruby of Fire. Then, the evil rodents had come and began chopping down trees. Strong Fur and the rest of the villagers were driven away. I watched Monkey Fur listening to her father. She looked angry. Father, please let me go with the strangers, she pleaded. Together we will stop the evil ones. We should not have to live in fear. After a few minutes, Strong Fur nodded. He hugged his daughter. You may go, he agreed. But remember, you must be sly like a monkey. The House of the Howling Spirits We decided to leave in the middle of the night. We crept on tippy paws out of our hut. Monkey fur met us on the path. She led us deep into the forest. Even though it was nighttime, it was hot, terribly hot. Sweat dripped off my tail, and my whiskers, and my eyelashes. Cheese niblets. I felt like I was locked in the sauna at the Muscle Mouse. Have you ever been there? It's a popular health club in New Mouse City. I went in once just to check it out. I got my tail stuck in the treadmill. I dropped a pink dumbbell on my paw. Then 
I fell off the bicycle. How embarrassing. Oh, well, you may have already guessed. I'm not very athletic. I was getting to be a good observer, though. Monkey fur had taught me how. I looked around. I saw all of the details I had never noticed before. I saw an insect hidden in a flower. I saw a snake underneath a mossy tree trunk. I saw a caiman sunk into the mud. I pulled Benjamin aside. I showed him all of these things. Now, he too could learn the difference between looking and seeing. In the meantime, Thea was busy snapping pictures right and left. Trap tried to get in all of her shots. Cheese, he squeaked, hanging from a vine. All of a sudden, we heard another squeak. No, it wasn't really a squeak. It was more like a scream. What is th 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 that? I stammered. Monkey fur motioned for us to stay quiet. That is the scream of the howling spirits. We must be close to their house, she whispered. I gulped. I was scared silly. I mean, who wants to meet a bunch of spirits? Especially howling ones. I wondered what they were howling about. Maybe they were hungry. Maybe they were cold. Or maybe they wanted to scare us living rodents to death. Then they take over our bodies, move into our homes, and rearrange our furniture. What a nightmare! Oh, how I hate these scary adventures. Who do I have to squash, boss? I pulled out my binoculars with shaky paws. I could see Nasty Tail's campsite. Then I saw something else. Hidden in the vegetation was a stone structure covered with vines. It was shaped like a pyramid. The only thing missing was a point at the top. All around the structure were tall columns of stone. It was the remains of an ancient Incan village. Professor Von Volt was so excited, he nearly squeaked with joy. Luckily, Trap put a paw over his mouth before he blew our cover. This is where our ancestors lived, Monkey Fur whispered. We lived here too, until the evil ones arrived. We crept nearer. The shadows kept us well hidden. We listened as Nasty Tail barked out orders. Tomorrow we will cut down all the trees surrounding the temple, he said. Those trees are very valuable. Soon we will be rolling in cheese. But we need to speed up the work. I want it all gone by the end of the day. Bones chewed his whiskers. Um, but... What about strong fur and the natives, boss? He asked. What will they do? Nasty Tail let out an evil laugh. I guess they didn't call him Nasty Tail for nothing. Mycin stood up and began punching the air. I'll tell him what to do, boss, he sniggered. Just tell me who to squash, and I'll squash him. He danced around in a circle like a boxing champion. Then... He tripped over a log. He landed on a pile of red earth. It was a termite nest. Mycin ran to the stream screaming. Ah! Bones was giggling under his whiskers. Nasty Tail shook his head. Such a big fool. He sighed. But where is the ruby? An hour later, Nasty Tail and his crew were sound asleep. We headed for the Temple of the Ruby of Fire. Monkey Fur led the way inside. Flickering candles hanging on the walls 
cast eerie shadows all around. My heart was racing as fast as my Uncle Cheese Belly at an all-you-can-eat cheddar buffet. Suddenly, we heard a blood-curdling scream. Do not worry. Those are just the howling spirits, Monkey Fur explained. Just the howling spirits? I felt like I was about to faint. Oh, how I wished I were home in my safe, comfy mouse hole. But before I could pass out, I saw something. No, not just one something. A whole lot of somethings. A bunch of black monkeys were swinging from the beams above our heads. They were howling at the top of their lungs. Just then, they spotted monkey fur. They came down to greet her. She spoke to them in a strange language. Ooh, ooh, hee, hee. The monkeys answered her with a big group hug. See, they will not hurt you, monkey fur told us. They are my friends. Professor Von Volt was busy studying the temple. He dictated some notes to his new assistant, Benjamin. I looked around. In the main room, there was a large, round well. A big, dusty stone covered the well. This is where I used to place the fruit for the howling spirits to eat, Monkey Fur said. It was once a sacrificial altar. Thea snapped away with her camera. The temple was fascinating. There were strange inscriptions on the walls in the hallway and drawings of all types of animals and plants. I felt like I was back in the time of the Incas. But where is the ruby? Trap asked Monkey Fur. A column of fire. Monkey Fur grinned. Then she pointed to the dusty stone covering the well. Trap wiped some of the dust off the stone. Then Thea took one of the torches off the wall and held it over the stone. Well, I'll be a rodent's uncle, Trap shouted. The stone sparkled in the light. We had found the ruby of fire. This stone hides a secret, Monkey Fur said. She told us the stone worked like a faucet. When you turned it, precious drops of the oil of fire came out. The villagers had been using the oil to light their lamps for centuries. I turned the ruby slowly. A few drops of dark liquid dripped out. Let me try that, Germeister, my cousin insisted. He pushed me aside. Then he yanked on the ruby full force. Stop! Everyone screamed. But it was too late. A huge spray of oil gushed out. A spark from Thea's torch made the oil burst into flames. The well became a column of fire. We didn't know what to do. We couldn't exactly call 911, but luckily, Monkey Fur came to our rescue. She slammed the big stone over the fire. The flames died down all at once. Pause up! Just then, I heard a noise. Pause up! A voice squeaked. We turned around. It was Nasty Tail and his crew. Fortunately, they had not seen the oil gushing out of the well. Hey, boss, that's Strong Fur's daughter, Bones told Nasty Tail. Let's hold her hostage. That will make her father obey us. Nasty Tail nodded. Good idea, he muttered. I was just going to say that. Mison stared at us with a menacing look. Who do you want me to squash, boss? He sneered. 
Just give me the word and I'll do it. Then he punched a stone slab. It broke in two and landed on his paw. A monkey bit his other paw. Ow! Mycin squeaked. Bones giggled under his whiskers. My cousin rolled his eyes. What a bunch of nitwits, he scoffed. You haven't even noticed the ruby. Thea elbowed him to keep quiet. But Bones perked up his ears. Yes, legend has it that there's a giant ruby hidden here, he grinned. We have to make them spill the beans, boss. Nasty Tail nodded. Um, right, spill the beans, he muttered. I was just going to say that. Mycin puffed up his chest. Do what the boss said. Spill the bean sprouts or I will squash you, he growled. This time, he didn't hit anything. Instead, he twirled around in a circle, punching the air. After a while, he had to sit down. He looked dizzy. Bones giggled. The rest of us kept quiet. The ruby was right under our snouts, but there was no way we were going to tell these bozos. Bones thought for a moment. Let's threaten to mouse nap monkey fur, he said to Nasty Tail. That will get them squeaking. Nasty Tail shook his head. Yes, yes, he agreed. I was just going to say that. They grabbed monkey fur. At that moment, the professor jumped up. Leave her alone, he commanded. The ruby is here, right under your snouts. He pointed to the well. The rotten rodent stared at the glittering stone. Three pairs of eyes opened wide. Three jaws hit the ground. Jackpot! They shrieked with glee. Ooh, ee, ooh. The three scoundrels pounced on the stone like a hungry cat on a sleeping mouse. The ruby is so big, Nasty Tail cried. I wonder what it's worth. Bones pulled a calculator out of his pocket. He punched in some numbers. Then he showed the total to Nasty Tail. Nasty Tail gulped. I'm rich, he shrieked. Just at that moment, a few drops of oil dripped out of the faucet. Bone stared at the oil. Boss, this is oil. There must be an oil well under this stone, he giggled. We won't be rich. We'll be stinking rich. Bones and Mycin slapped paws. We're stinking rich! We're stinking, stinking rich! They chanted. They were so excited, they did cartwheels around the room. They looked like two mouselets on Christmas morning. Nasty Tail frowned. I am the boss, he roared. I will say who is rich around here. Then he ordered them to haul the stone away. I noticed monkey fur waving to the monkeys. They had been watching us from the ceiling. Ooh, ooh, ee, ee, monkey fur yelled. In a flash, the monkeys sprang at the three villains. They began to hit them with stones and leftover avocados. I watched with envy. Those monkeys were good shots. I wondered if they ever thought about starting a baseball team, but I didn't get a chance to ask. Seconds later, Nasty Tail's two sidekicks had dropped the ruby. We, we give, give up! up. Make, Make them stop! The villains cried. The Army of the Howling Spirits. Monkey Fur shouted another order. Immediately, the monkey squatted in front of her. How amazing! They were as disciplined as a little army. She gave some fruit to the monkeys. They nibbled on it happily. For years, we have fed the army 
of the howling spirits, our friend explained. They are the guardians of the ruby and our precious oil well. But we do not want to use too much oil. We should not waste what nature gives us. The professor nodded. Monkey fur is right, he said. Happiness comes from wanting only what you need. Too many rodents in the world today want more than is necessary. We are squeezing the earth as if it were a lemon. Soon there will be no natural resources left for future generations. I thought about what the professor had said. He was right. We needed to take care of our environment. I vowed to use only recycled paper from now on. And maybe I could use less water. I could turn off the water when I brushed my teeth. And I could take a bath every other night instead of every night. Although that last one would be tough. I love a nice hot cheddar bubble bath. It's a great way to escape from the rat race. Cheddar bubbles, take me away. The True Guardian of the Ruby I was still dreaming about that bubble bath when I heard a loud crash. I gasped. Nasty Tail had smashed the ruby with his machete. If I can't have it, no one can, he sneered. Monkey Fur burst into tears. The ruby is lost forever, she groaned. But for some reason, a strange smile crept over her face. Why? I wondered what secret she was hiding this time. Trap tied up the villains with his rope. They sat glumly underneath a tall tree. Then, Monkey Fur led us to the other side of the temple. I have a surprise for you, she said with a wink. She pushed aside some banana leaves. They hid a narrow tunnel. At the bottom of the tunnel, I saw two yellow eyes shining. They belonged to an enormous boa constrictor. It was guarding a sparkling ruby. Monkey Fur hissed. The snake slid obediently toward her. I was impressed. Monkey Fur couldn't read or write, but she could speak two other languages. Monkey, and now Snake. The snake placed the ruby in Monkey Fur's paw. She explained that this was the real ruby. For many years, evil rodents had been trying to steal it. So the villagers came up with a plan. They would put a fake ruby inside the temple. The boa constrictor guarded the real ruby day and night. Thea turned on her two-way radio. She put in a call to the local police. We have captured three nasty rodents, she said. They have been cutting down all of the trees in the forest. Please come and get them. Over and out. Be sly, like a monkey. The police arrived the next morning. Trap led them to the tall tree, but the evil rodents were gone. Trap's rope lay on the ground in pieces. My cousin blushed. Oops, he mumbled. I must have used my trick breakaway rope by accident. It's great for practical jokes, but not so good for catching criminals. The police shook their heads. Too bad, the shorter officer sighed. We'll never find them. It's too easy to hide in this forest. Just then, I noticed Monkey Fur giggling under her whiskers. Don't be so sure of that. Follow me, she said. I had a feeling that monkey fur was up to something. But what? We walked along the path that led to the village. That's when we spotted a deep hole covered with twigs. 
It was a trap. Down below, Nasty Tail was jumping up and down in anger. Get me out of here, he shrieked. We burst out laughing. A little bit farther, we saw Mike Mison. He was dangling upside down from a vine. Help, he cried. But what about Bones? Where was Bones? Well, we came across him soon enough. He was trapped in a wooden cage. Monkey Fur had caught every last one of them. She was one clever mouse. I was lucky to be learning from her. I was just following my father's advice, Monkey Fur explained. Be sly as a monkey. After all, that is how I got my name. The Headache Plant The next day, Strong Fur and the rest of the villagers, big and small, returned to their homes. They were happy to be back near the Temple of the Ruby of Fire. They invited us to stay for a while. I was excited. Now I would have time to finish teaching Monkey Fur how to read and write. In return, she tried to teach me how to speak to the monkeys. I guess I wasn't very good, though. The monkeys laughed and laughed when I practiced. Trap and Thea joined them. Face it, Cherry Berry! You just can't squeak their language! My cousin smirked. Finally, it was time to leave. I started to pack my bags, but my head was pounding. I had a terrible headache. I'm sorry, Geronimo. I seem to have lost a first aid kit, said the professor. I sighed. Headaches are no fun. I noticed warm fur watching me. She stood up. I can fix your head, she said. She ran away into the woods. Warm fur must have thought she was giving me a headache. But she returned a few minutes later. She was carrying a little plant. The leaves were shaped like hearts. Warm fur ground up the leaves into a juice. Drink, she ordered, giving me the juice. So I did. I mean, I didn't want to insult her. But I was nervous. What if the juice made my tail fall off? What if I sprouted wings? I closed my eyes. Don't panic, I told myself. It didn't work. I opened my eyes. I couldn't put my paw on it, but something was missing. I wiggled my tail. I waved my paws. Then I felt my head. Now I knew what was missing. My headache was gone. Warm Fur smiled. This is a magic, she said. It is science. We call this the headache plant. Soon the professor and Warm Fur were chatting away about science and plants. They were like two old friends. I love every tree. I love every flower. On the flight home, Benjamin snuggled next to me. He was filled with questions about the Amazon forest. He asked me about the animals who live there. He asked me about the plants. I told him that many of the plants and animals in the forest are endangered. Pollution was slowly killing them off. We were losing some of the Earth's most amazing treasures. Benjamin shook his head sadly. That is awful, Uncle, he said. He pulled out his notebook. Then he wrote this poem about nature. I love every tree. I love every flower. I love every tree. I love every flower. I love everything in nature, every minute, every hour.
clear and crystal waters, stars that shine way high above, rich green forests filled with creatures. That is what I love. A living present. The next morning, I was happy to be back at work. Don't get me wrong, I love the rainforest, but I missed the rodent's gazette. Plus, I wasn't crazy about sleeping in the forest. I missed my comfy, cozy bed. And then there was my mega huge fridge. I was thinking about my favorite cheeses when Benjamin burst into my office. Look, Uncle, I brought you a surprise, he squeaked. It's an avocado pit. You can grow it into a plant. I wanted to give you something living. He put the glass on my desk. I gave him a hug. Isn't my nephew the sweetest mouse in the world? Now he grabbed my paw. Uncle, guess what? My teacher wants to know if you will come to our school. You could tell everyone about our adventures in the Amazon, he said. Oh, can you, Uncle? Pretty please with a cheddar ball on top? I grinned. How could I say no to such an adorable rodent? What is the Amazon forest? On Monday, I went to school with Benjamin. His friends asked lots of questions. I squeaked and squeaked until I was blue in the face. Well, I guess I didn't really turn blue. After all, have you ever seen a blue mouse? We hope you have enjoyed this production of Geronimo Stilton, The Temple of the Ruby of Fire by Geronimo Stilton, read by Bill Lobley. This program was produced and directed by Paul Rubin, executive producer Cheryl Smith, with music by Tom Marsh. Copyright 2003 by Edizioni Pieme SPA. English translation 2004 by Edizioni Pieme SPA. Production copyright 2007 Scholastic Inc. All rights reserved. <laughs>